In 1978, my guest Toni Morrison won the National Book Critics Circle Award for her novel Song of Solomon. All of her books, which include Tar Baby, Sula, and The Bluest Eye, have been praised for how they so richly and honestly portray black American experiences. Morrison's new novel, Beloved, is set in 1873, after the Civil War, and it's about escaped and emancipated slaves who are trying to build new lives but are haunted by the past. The main character, Sethi, lives with the ghost of her two-year-old baby girl. Sethi slit her baby's throat 18 years earlier rather than let her be recaptured into slavery. The ghost is known as Beloved, the one word that was printed on her tombstone. In this week's Sunday New York Times book review, Margaret Atwood wrote, if there were any doubts about Morrison's stature as a preeminent American novelist of her own or any other generation, Beloved will put them to rest. In three words or less, it's a hair raiser. I spoke to Toni Morrison earlier today from the NPR Bureau in New York, and she told me how she prepared herself emotionally to write a book about slavery. Well, I couldn't um, determine it. It was very ad hoc. I found, or I always suspected that I didn't have the emotional stability to live in that world for the three or four years, however long it would take to examine it. So I did it, um, I suppose, the way they did it, uh, which was a little bit at a time. I had to keep telling myself that if they could live in it, then it must be possible for me to write about it. And whenever I got um, or felt overwhelmed, I would just stop. It was very difficult. You were reimagining that period and, and having to immerse yourself in it to write about it. But what did you do to actually put yourself back in time to understand that time and, and to get the kind of detail that you needed for the book? I relied um, on small entrances into that world. Um, the very serious problem of trying to make the story overwhelm the situation. Because if you start out to write a book about slavery, you are probably already lost because it's big and it's long. And you discover how long 200 years is. Um, not five years, not 10, but 200. So that you have to have an anchor or a mooring. And the mooring is a, co a group of characters who you are caring about very deeply, uh, but a small group in one place with some central action, all of which is um, impacted by uh, the condition of slavery. But you couldn't tell yourself, or I couldn't tell myself, that I was writing a book about slavery because it would have I would have drowned in that. So I went into it sort of backwards and concentrated on the theme that I had begun with, which has to do with that tension between nurturing and being an individual. I think there have been a lot of books and movies that have actually really trivialized slavery um, or where slavery becomes the backdrop for you know a romantic story or, or something like that. Did you feel in advance of sit sitting down to write this book that there were certain traps that you had to avoid in order to really get to the truth of the experience? Yeah. Uh, I think that was part of the fear, um, trying to avoid the um, routine treatment. The first, of course, is just trying not to have the plot be slavery, since that's predictable and boring and you're in it and you want to get out. In other words, not to have slavery drive the book. Um, the second is that, um, and I'm included in this group, everybody thinks you sort of know all about it. Uh, but until you project into it, um, most of the information is is um, so sensational, so exotic, so alien, and so pathological that it's difficult to grasp. And the fact is that most slave stories that focus on the slaves focus on them as the... Uh, pathological ones, um, and never 
focus on the pathology in which they live and in which they are exercising everything they know about being human in order to maintain that position. So that the trivial treatments of, make, of, of uh, slave stories sometimes as written and sometimes as filmed is as though this was a kind of, uh, as you say, scene in which other things of infinitely more interest than the lives of the slaves was, um, were going on. Uh, part of your novel is about um, Beloved, which is um, the ghost of a two-year-old baby. Um, and I, I wonder if this idea of a two-year-old baby's ghost coming back to haunt the house of her mother is based on a story that you ever heard. Well, no. Uh, I've heard a lot of ghost stories. <laughs> Not that one, but I, in imagining the life of this woman who... Uh, this woman, Setha, whose life I invented, um, although it was based on the life of a real woman, a real slave woman who, in fact, did precisely what Setha did. Uh, in inventing it, it seemed to me that the question to be asked of a mother that made that claim could best be asked by the daughter she killed. That... Um, the legitimate query about motherhood and individuality and freedom and responsibility and all of these questions about love should be asked by the daughter. So that I made history or the past flesh palpable and just created a situation in which the dialogue could take place one-on-one -on -one. It's not new for me because I frequently use uh, presences uh, in order to illustrate whatever I have to say about the past or about history and also to reflect that intimate association between the living and the dead, um, which is part of an older black culture but also suggests something about memory and the past, which I can handle better in narrative than... Uh, you know, with real presences than I would be able to. I think I don't want to be abstract and, you know, to pontificate and to editorialize about these things. So the drama of having the uh, murdered self or the abused past sit down at the table with you uh, was just a strategy that I found extremely exciting for myself. And also I was in competition with, uh, with slavery. I mean, the um, imagination of the slave holders and the um, sensational aberrations that slave holders came up, a kind of really creative cruelty, um, was simply too much to absorb it. So I had to keep cleaning it up and pushing it back and making my story much less sensational than the real story of what slavery was about. And my competition would involve my stress on the, you know, sort of personal, if exotic, nature of this confrontation between a woman and her daughter who is dead. Novelist Toni Morrison is my guest, and we're discussing her new novel, Beloved. Were there ghost stories passed on in your family or uh, stories that were told even, even to scare the children at night that, that, <laughs> that lay behind your including the story of a ghost in your novel? Well, I think we, I certainly remember ghost stories that were told in my family among all the adults, and I think it's representative of, uh, you know, pre-television family entertainment. I meet a lot of people who had similar childhoods. But they were certainly not um, for us in the sense that these were not adults telling stories to children in order to instruct or scare or even entertain them because they were telling these stories over and over again to themselves. And we were listeners to them, but they enjoyed the repetition of these stories, uh, certainly uh, as much as we did. And then when 
you know, as we got older, we were asked to tell our own and retell those that we had heard. So in that sense, it was a pickup, you know, a sustained um, line of storytelling that I have uh, uh, complete recollections of stories that my mother told me and my father told me and my aunts and uncles that their parents had told them and their parents had told them in that way they vary a great deal from some of those same stories I've seen printed. But yes, it was a very strong tradition of storytelling. Do you think that kind of storytelling had anything to do with you being a writer? I guess it must have done, although I started writing so late. I don't, I didn't give it any real value <laughs> in the beginning. My guest is novelist Toni Morrison, and her new novel is titled Beloved. It's just been published by Knopf. We're going to talk some more about her life and her writing, but first we're going to take a short break. This is Fresh Air. Novelist Toni Morrison is my guest. There's a sentence in your book where one of the characters talks about the serious work of beating back the past. I really like that sentence very much, or that fragment of a sentence, and it really gives a sense of, of kind of keep, keeping bad memories and things that haunt you away and all the effort that it takes to not remember mm -hmm. those things. And, and I, I wonder if slavery was a memory like that in, in your family, if that was information that was kind of kept out and, and kept from the children. Well, that I wouldn't know. Um, the people in my family whom I knew who had been born in slavery did not pass on that kind of information. And that's par probably the provocation for dealing with it anyway. You know, there's an enormous necessity to get on, to have a future, to wake up the next day, so that the creative processes of forgetting um, become elaborate. In addition, there is the absolute necessity for remembering certain things. Um, this business of not confronting the past, of not knowing it, of living in a world in which we are so satisfied, you know, with guilt instead of the real emotion that guilt simply stands for. And it seemed to me a very contemporary problem as well as one of slavery um, because beating back the past, not recognizing all of the information in the past is both a blessing and a curse. Um, it's a curse because you, you lose a lot of information. The necessity for being innocent, uh, which is, you know, the classic American novels, desire is that the hero didn't do it, is somehow innocent and free and uh, uh, washed white, makes us sometimes appear to be um, simple-minded because it seems overwhelmingly important uh, in the mainstream literature that no one has any responsibility for the society in which he or she lives. And that has been the so-called result of a country, you know, which is based on the erasure of the past and the future, the pioneer, uh, the territory, uh, the immigrant who gets rid of the old country and the wicked past and cleans the slate. Now, on the one hand, that's a sort of a desirable, um, dreamy sort of existence, but on the other, it makes it impossible for anybody to take seriously the history that is the country. And of course, that would affect black people as well, who may or may not pass on for purely reasons of psychological and emotional survival information that was too terrible to describe so that at the end of the text, with some tongue-in-cheek, but with some accuracy as well, I write the sentence three times. Uh, this is not a story to pass on. Although, in fact, that is what I'm doing in the text. Well, you're doing it generations after it happened. I guess that makes a difference. Yeah, it makes a difference because I'm not always sure that such stories can be written at the time they take place anyway. I mean, I'm just not sure that uh, anybody in 18th 
73 or 76 in Reconstruction could have written it anyway. I mean, or if they did, they would have written something else. The slave narratives and the speeches and the letters of the period were, you know, quite different. And whether or not the whole thing could be encompassed in a novel, I mean, many people have, have believed that it could be and have tried their hands at it. But that would never have occurred to, I don't think, a black person in 1873 because no novel, you know, the imagination has already been, you know, sort of overwhelmed by the fact. You know, but I think a lot of uh, children who grew up in families of um, Holocaust survivors or uh, families in which there's there was you know, history in uh, a history of, of slavery someplace, g get almost parables told to them about what could happen and why you have to live life a certain way to, you know, protect yourself against certain evils and how you have to rise above um, the horrors that were inflicted on on your grandparents or whatever. Did, did, you, did you get lectures like that from your parents? No, I didn't. I, I got other messages from them which were much more valuable because those are very negative, the ones you just recited. Uh, I mean, it's undue burdens as though I'm somehow responsible for um, all of that. What they did, which I found really quite healthy, was they assumed, without ever articulating it, that we were uh, capable and quite bright and in some way morally superior <laughs> to those who had degraded themselves by trying to degrade us. And that information was was so consistent. Um, they seemed to feel that, you know, there were rich people or there were white people or there were wicked people who really had uh, a lot of answering to do for themselves. And we were not like that. So I always felt very special. Uh, and I've always felt, for purposes of, you know, xenophobia doesn't work, but I always thought that we were um, on a higher plane than other people, not because there was fear out there, not because white people could make me into something less, because they never believed that was the case. What they could do would be to kill me or maim me, but they could never make me have be without quality. And that was so much a part of my upbringing and everybody else I knew in that town, and we were very, very poor people, that I, it took me years to be able to articulate what it was that made me feel like I belonged in this place. And it was this, rather than giving me all these sort of uh, sermonizing about terror. In other words, I was not afraid. But you had a lot of self-respect. Yeah, because I mean, they I mean, that, that's what this is yeah, about, that about was, building self-respect. Yeah. But it wasn't, you must have self... I hear people say, that's right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you are too. somebody. <laughs> you really are good. Yeah, I mean, you that know, helps, right. And then people say, oh, yeah, well, then maybe it's a possibility that I'm not. But these, they, they were not surprised at, at, at superior work. Were you the first person in your family to go to college? No. Really? Mm -mm. I had an uncle who went to Ohio State. So it wasn't a big symbolic thing for you well, to go? It was a big economic <laughs> problem for me to go, and so shaky, uh, money being so scarce, that uh, my mother uh, took a job to help out. My father had two, and more often than not, three jobs in order to take care of us, but I remember them saying, look, uh, we can guarantee you one year. After that, we'll see. So I went away uh, feeling very blessed about the fact that there was a year available to me, but not ever believing th that I would have a second year or be able to pay for a second year. And I also worked. But, you know, things were very different then. You went to uh, a black college. You went to Howard University mm -hmm. in, in Washington. Um, looking back, are, are you glad that you went to a black university instead of, uh, well... I guess so many, <laughs> so many of the universities then were really basically segregated. Oh, sure they were. Yeah. It was a white versus black. Right. The situation probably in the. Well, you went to Cornell though afterwards for graduate school, at mm -hmm. where you were one of just a handful of black students, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, 
I wanted very much to go to Howard University, not a black college, but one in particular, and that was Howard, uh, which was different from many other black colleges because I had not ever been among um, black people who read as much as I did and I thought would be as smart as I was in terms of, of reading and learning um, because I had never lived without the presence of white people in school and in neighborhoods and so on. And I really wanted to know what life was like with nobody else there but us, the way it was in my family, but not on the street. So I was very much interested in that. And I lived very close to Oberlin, and I remember my mother thought Oberlin was a very good idea, and it had such a wonderful history of, you know, admitting women and blacks and so on without being persuaded long, long time ago before. Emancipation Proclamation. Anyway, I didn't want to do that, and I went to Howard, and I don't regret it. Um, and I went to graduate school at Cornell because it was, um, it had an English department um, that had an extraordinary reputation, and I was not, uh, I would not be in a situation that was unlike all my 12 years of public school, you know, by being in a predominantly white school because I was always in a situation of being the only black or the one of three blacks from first grade through 12. You, know, you said you wanted to go to Howard to see what it was like when it was just black people. Mm -hmm. Was it what you expected? Partly. The faculty was extraordinary, I think. And I ended up with a group of students whom I found to be certainly the best of any that I've ever met. But there were differences there that I had not anticipated, and they were class differences. I had not been among what I suppose now we'd call middle-class black people who were mirror images of middle-class white people. Um, that was a surprise. When did you start to write? Not too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, I was um, an adult. I was not a young, aspiring writer. I had two children. You had children already when you started? Mm -hmm. That's funny because so many writers uh, stop for a while when they have children or, or find it very hard to write when they have children. Mm -hmm. They do. They say they do. But I um, didn't. I mean, I, my life changed completely, and I found myself eager to read a certain kind of book, so I didn't know where it was, so I played around with writing it and liked the process, and I wasn't at that time all that interested in publishing, uh, even though I was in publishing by then. But I just was, it was a way of thinking and, re and remembering. It was order out of chaos. It was everything that every writer's ever said. Um, that process, that creative process is. All I know is that when I did that first book, I didn't ever want to not be without something like that to do. So, um, in the evening, you know, young children sleep early in the day. Uh, so I had three, four hours in the evening, and that's what I did. Maybe it was another way of doing what uh, my family and friends had done when I was young, which is telling stories at night to entertain yourself. But at any rate, it ended up being a novel. For years you were an editor as well as a writer, and I think you recently gave up editing. Is that right? That's true. I did. Well, why did, you, did you do that to have more time to write? Mm, I don't know. I, I think I had some very clear reasons for it at the time I did it, when I'd done it a long, long time. Um, and then, too, I think at some point I didn't think of it as going away to write with more time, although that is, in fact, what happened, but I had some problems with with uh, grabbing that, so to speak, for myself. You know, I didn't even call myself a writer until after I'd published the third book. I always called myself an editor who, or a teacher who. It was very difficult to say, I'm a writer and that's what I do, and I don't do anything else, because I've never been able to not do anything else. But I thought, that I really wanted to see, th to take a risk. You know, with children you can't take certain kinds of risks. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to, not to end up in my grave not having done some things. And one of them was to see whether or not it was possible 
to um, live and support myself and my family and the other people who have claims on me um, by writing and or lecturing or, as I put it at that time, to live like the grown-ups did. Um, so that meant to leave the security of the publishing company. In addition to that, I think there were some... I was, must have been feeling that I didn't want to take care of other people's business anymore. I wanted to take care of my own. Well, has it made writing any easier to have stopped doing the editing part of your work? Oh, no. no writing's never, never easy. easy. <laughs> well, what did happen, though, was it got better, I think. The writing got better because uh, of the way in which I could shape the time. You know, you have longer time to not write badly. <laughs> because you're not squeezing it in? Yeah, and you don't have to rewrite. I mean, you know, I rewrite so much mm -hmm. that when I'm doing it on in the evenings and weekends and it's short spurts, that takes a long, long time. Uh, this time I could uh, do rewrites better because there were sustained periods, you know, because I didn't have to sort of go to work in the middle of it. Right. Well, I want to thank you very much for talking with us about your life and your writing. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me. My guest has been Toni Morrison. Her new novel is titled Beloved, and it's published by Knopf. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air.